I'm Helen McDonald, writer of Ages for Hawk, and I'm here with James Aldred, a tree climber, wildlife cameraman, and author of the book, The Man Who Climbed Trees. I first met James in the Forest of Dean last year, and he made me climb a tree. It was a disaster. <laughs> <laughs> um, he was filming wild goshawks, uh, and you know, he sat up in a hide for, how many hours was it, 200 and? Yeah, I can't remember, I did work it out, but it, in, in all it was about three weeks. About three weeks yeah. in a small box up a tree. I mean, he's a man of enormous stamina, and uh, his story is extraordinary, uh, an extraordinary one. It's a delight to know him. So James, what does your job as a wildlife cameraman entail? Uh, a lot of sitting around waiting for non-cooperative animals to behave themselves. <laughs> a lot of patience required, but I specialise in, in climbing, so filming in the rainforest canopy. So all um, those extraordinary shots of the forest from high up, they tend to be you in a tree? Yes, yeah, so I combined uh, rope work with camera work um, quite early on and it, it was kind of a, a, a bit of a niche, not many people were doing it then. Um, but it, it unlocked an entire world up in the, in the rainforest canopy, which is seldom seen. So that's what I specialise in. So things like primates, uh, which rarely come to the ground, uh, nesting birds, um, which you, you just never see otherwise, that sort of thing. So James, you've climbed a lot of trees. Yeah. Taken a lot of wildlife footage. Yes. What's the most nerve-wracking experience you've had while doing that? Well, it's normally around the filming. Once you're actually filming, everything's running as it should be and you can focus on the animal and, and all that. But just getting everything set up, putting the platforms up, wrecking the tree, finding a tree in the first place. Um, probably, uh, there's been quite a few incidents over the year, but probably This the is most... true. In fact, um, <laughs> reading your book, it's a bit like, you know, it's like one of those sort of tales of daring do from the 19th century, but not evil. I well, mean, basically uh, every tree you climb seems to involve life and death situations. Just a complete disaster. <laughs> And I'm convinced that people reading it will actually just come to the conclusion that I'm a nutter because I did everything wrong at every stage. When I look back at it and I write, when I was writing it, I was thinking, well, why did I do that? There's no rational explanation for why I left my water bottle on the ground, why I got dehydrated, why I got stuck in the tree. Why the you top, found the bees. Why I found the bees, yeah, exactly. Um, I would say overall, the, the, the thing that really I found most nerve-wracking was getting caught in an um, emergent storm in Borneo, in the middle of a storm, um, emergent tree in the middle of a storm. So <coughs> the emergent tree is basically one that's punctures at the top of the canopy, yeah, it's exactly. right up there, it's in the kind of exposed. place you don't want to be when there's a lightning storm. Exactly, yeah, and the topography in Borneo is very rugged, it's sort of ridge after ridge after ridge, and the, uh, the trees there are the tallest tropical trees on the planet. So an emergent tree has to be even taller than those, and that's their natural habitat. So they're sort of pushing 260, wow. but from 260 up to nigh on three, I'm convinced someone's going to find a 300 foot tall tree in Borneo soon. But getting to the top of that and then being faced with a storm that came in, I was uh, severely dehydrated, I couldn't use my muscles, I couldn't climb back down, so I was a bit of a sitting duck really. And uh, and that was terrifying because that was a real, real, I, I kind of paid lip service to the awesomeness that is nature and all of that, but actually, and I'm sure mariners and seafarers could, you know, if I'd have done my research properly or, or spoken to someone like that, they, they would say the most dangerous thing is, is, is weather. And being caught out in the top of that tree was a real eye-opener, scared the life out of me. I'm glad you got through that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> so this is, I guess, kind of quite a negative line of questioning. Um, you have been bitten, torn, scratched and stung in your line of duty. What was the worst? Mm, I, think, I think bees are pretty close up. Their swarms of bees are, pre uh, are pretty bad. The thing is, when, when, when they sting you, 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 you know it's, that's as good as it's ever going to get on the timeline. It, it's, good. it's a massively downward spiral that um, just everything begins to unravel. As soon as you get one sting, you know that the next three are, are about to happen. And before you know it, you've got several hundred, if not a thousand all over you, and they're all trying to get you. And you know that is not going to get away. And the only person that can get you out of that is yourself. And if you panic too much, which is a very natural response, all the adrenaline comes up, it's fighting against the toxins and you, you lose your spatial awareness, you have to go back into a very, very deep-seated, automatic, <laughs> almost reptilian part of your muscle memory where you just rely on your hands being able to do the rope drills to get you out of there because, you know, sort of conscious thought's gone out the window. You're yeah, panicking, your brain is you're, fried, you're yeah. screaming in, yeah. in your head thinking, this is bad, this is bad, deal with it, but I can't deal. But meantime, your hands are actually like playing a musical instrument. Your hands are getting on with it and getting you out of there. Um, but, but bees, hornets, wasps are, are, are pretty intimidating things when they really lay into you. Blimey. Yeah. 
What is the most mind-blowing thing that you have witnessed from the top of a tree? I'd like to say something like Krakatoa. <laughs> but you did <laughs> No. no. <laughs> I think as boring as it sounds, just endless forest rolling away from you to the horizon. Millions upon millions of trees. Um, and, and just all the associated thoughts um, that that conjures up in your minds. All the mysteries, all of the unknowns out there. All of the species, you know, all of the animals, all the organisms that we know nothing about. Mm. And they're all out there maybe waiting to be discovered, you know, or maybe waiting, you know, teetering on the brink of extinction the way we're going. Or maybe and they're going to carry on after we're gone, you know. It's, it's well, that's a nice thought, isn't it, yeah. actually? You that's know. the optimism in me there. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It, when it all boils down to it, yeah, as long as a bit of bacteria survives, then hopefully, you know, next time around we'll make a better job of it. But, Existential uh, yeah. thoughts from me and James. Yeah, <laughs> exactly, yeah. But um, really, the most awe-inspiring thing, the most amazing thing I've ever seen from any tree is just, you know, a big forest, more trees really, as, as boring as that sounds. Yeah. But it, it's comforting to know that actually, um, you know, in this day and age of sort of gloomy predictions, there is actually, it's not too late, there's a hell of a lot of forest still left. Mm. If we can just get our act together yeah. to save it, yeah. then, uh, yeah. so yeah. So one of the questions I get asked a lot, is what is it about hawks that you yeah. find so alluring? And yeah. I usually say they're the most beautiful things the world's ever made. And now I'm going to turn the tables and I'm going to ask <laughs> you the question, what is it about trees? Well, for a start, it's a very strongly emotional response that I find uh, difficult to quantify. I've, I've had a real go at trying to quantify it. And I think it's because they represent to me um, a tangible link to nature. You know, as a species, as individuals, we're passing through um, through nature in a way um, and we're moving so quickly but trees are there they're fixed points in the landscape you know an hour's drive south from here is a tree that's 4,000 years old 4,000 years old yeah. and when you think oh buildings are the most permanent thing or whatever well actually no I mean when you start talking about thousands of years you're in geological time yeah. almost um, so they really do I think um, give a very strong timeline um, against which one can measure their lifetime, really. And far from being depressing, I think it flips it around and it puts the onus on the individual to realise that it's a very fleeting existence, make the most of it. Yeah, absolutely.